Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to today's reading group. So last week, Shi Chang introduced definitions of curves and the associated uh, tangent and normal vectors. And today I'm gonna extend them to a higher dimension. Uh, we'll be talking about surfaces and some manifolds. And for today's outline, I'm gonna first introduce the theoretical definition for surfaces and some manifolds. I'm gonna talk about two different definitions, the parametric definition and differential geometry definition. Then I'm gonna talk about some properties of some manifolds, which include tangent space, normal space, and orientation. And finally, we will be less mathematical and bring things back to computer science and consider how to represent surfaces uh, in computer. So we'll, in particular, we'll talk about triangle mesh. Okay, so today our focus will be on embedded surfaces. So there are two keywords. The first one is surfaces, uh, which means that it, intrinsically it will be 2D. And the, uh, the second keyword is embedded, which means that the surface is located embedded in, in 3D space which give us the luxury to use the coordinates in the 3D space and also the inner products defining it, which allows us to do well, analysis and define interesting stuff. And so the first question we want to answer is how to define an embedded surface. Because I think we, are, we all take our calculus class. So I think the parametric definition is the definition that's most familiar to us, which is a differential function, FUV, defined on a 2D space, and it maps a two point on a plane to uh, a point in the 3D space. However, if it's just a sim simple definition like that, then there might some be pathological cases which we don't want. So if you remember the pathological cases Shi Chang introduced last week, you'll find that this uh, pathological cases are very similar. So in the first example, you can see that the function is perfectly differentiable. The problem is it has nothing to do with V. Therefore, this function it actually just describes a curve instead of surface. And the second, in the second example, the F is always zero. So this uh, F describes a point, also not a surface. And the, Third example is a little more special compared to the first two because, well, the figure below shows the image of this function f. And you can see that in most of the place, this, fun this uh, looks just like a surface we want. However, uh, if we consider the points where v equals to zero, uh, which is actually the line here, then, uh, then this thing will become something like a cusp. So like here a cusp. So it is not a, a differential of surface that we want. So that's why we also want to uh, ex exclude this case in our uh, definition. So that brings the question, uh, what conditions should we add in order to avoid all these pathological cases? So to, to understand what uh, the really problem of this uh, pathological cases, we will use the Jacobian matrix. So just a quick review, the Jacobian matrix uh, for, uh, for a function from Rn to Rn is an N by M matrix. And it basically describes all possible partial derivative of function F. And <clears throat> uh, so I'm gonna write some notes. So you, this just let me know if you can see, you see things clearly. So with the Jacobian matrix, and with the Taylor expansion, we can actually given a, a function f and a, a point p, then it, within its local neighborhood, fq can be approximated by uh, fp plus its Jacobian matrix times q minus p times some, um, uh, I think this, some small order. Right, so this is the uh, Taylor expansion, first order Taylor expansion. So it tells us that 
uh, how to <coughs> approximate this local neighborhood using a, a hyperplane. And if you take a look at this df here, if df equals to zero, then all these things just tell us a point. So it will be, become a point instead of a plane. And also, if the rank of this Jacobian matrix is one, then things will become a line. So it will form the cusp example in our pathological cases. So to sum up, the, we can, from this equation, we can see that uh, if the Jacobian matrix is not full rank, then it fails to tell us some information about this, uh, how, about the derivative in some direction. Therefore, this uh, locally it will not be a plane that we want. So that's what mm, this, this is a thing we want to avoid in our definition. Therefore, to define a, a more well defined, to give a more well defined definition for a surface, uh, we add one requirement in the parametric definition, which is the Jacobian matrix of the function f should be full rank. Yeah, so that will be the parametric definition of the surface and as a manifold. So, or do we have questions for that so far? Well, then I'm gonna continue. So uh, the parametric definition, you can see that is quite simple and it's quite easy to understand. However, in practice, it is not very useful now, sometimes it's just difficult to find a parameterized function to describe our surface. Like in this example, we can see this crazy surface. And if you suddenly you tr really try to, to um, express it using one function, you'll find it's really difficult to do. And in fact, it's not clear that if every surface can be given by a single function. So that's why. Although the parametric definition is simple, but it's not really useful in practice because sometimes we, can ju we just cannot find such a f. So we want to uh, give a more, we'll give another definition which allows us to uh, describe or to express the surface or the sum uh, more easily. So that's why we came to the differential geometry definition. So if you remember, uh, what Shi Chang told uh, taught about last week, it, uh, he, he taught the uh, diff differential geometry definition for the curve. So that is basically for any point in this curve, it will, con it will just consider the local neighborhood of this point and it de describe this, uh, describe the curve within this local neighborhood using a parameterized function. And we will do uh, the similar things for surface. That is, so consider this surface and for this specific point, if we intersect with this local neighborhood with a ball, then we will get something very similar to a plane. And this plane will be much easier to, to describe uh, using the parameter function. Okay, so just to sum up the, I think to my understanding, the most, major difference between the parametric definition and the differential geometry definition is that in parametric definition, we use one global function to describe the uh, whole curve or the whole surface. But in differential geometry definition, we consider things locally. We just, for, any, for each point in the uh, surface, we only describe its uh, we only consider its local neighborhood and we describe its local neighborhood using one parametric function. So that's the uh, difference between the parametric function, uh, parametric definition and the differential geometry definition. So, uh, so once we can all agree on that, then we can see the uh, formal definition for uh, some manifolds. So actually the sub manifolds is just a generalization for a surface. So the curve is in one D is one D, and the surface is two D, and the sub manifolds just can be arbitrary and and dimensional. And 
So I'm gonna just read this definition and then explain how what does it really does. Now, so a, a set M is an M-dimensional submanifold. If for each P belongs to M, there exists an open set U and a W and a function G. So from U intersect with HM. So HM definition is here and to the end such that the P and G, so one-to-one -one and smooth map with Jacobian is rank M and emitting a continuous universe. So, it, so it, if you just look at it, it, it might sound very, compli very complicated, but actually it's not. So what it really does is just take a look at P and then it only can use, use, use an open set, but you can just consider it's a ball to intersect with the, the sub manifold. So you'll get a, something like a sphere, which, which, might, which is much simpler to describe using a, a parameterized function G. And this G is required to be, well, smooth, one-to-one, -one, for uh, Jacobian matrix to be full rank and have an inverse. And, but in this definition, it also allows the, the sub manifolds to have boundary. So this, in this example, the, the surface does not have a boundary, it's a closed surface. But if we draw, so if you look at my notes, so if we draw a surface like this, then points are here, points are there, it's like the boundary point. And actually, if you look at its local neighborhood, you'll find that it's not a plane, but it, it is a half plane. So that's why uh, to accommodate such special case, they allow the, uh, they add a HM here, which is basically just to you know, accommodate the boundary case, which allows the pre-image to also be a half plane instead of a whole, instead of the uh, uh, entire plane. Okay, so that's the differential geometry definition for some manifolds. Do we have questions so far? So, so I have a question about HM. So, so from what you just said, HM here means a uh, half plane. Yeah. So here, uh, the, the the in the lower left oh, corner, yeah. it's just oh, I see. specifically taken for HM. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So if we're all good, then let's just move on. So I finished introduced the. There are two definitions for surface and submanifolds. And oh, by the way, so why is it called submanifolds instead of just manifolds? It's just because we are considered things uh, embedded in uh, higher dimensional, in this case, n dimensional space. So that's why it's called submanifold. But actually, I believe that submanifolds and manifolds, they're just uh, refer to the same thing, except that the sub manifold is located embedded in the dimensional space, but the manifold is not, it's just itself. Okay, so once we understand the definition for surface and sub manifolds, let's move on to the properties. Uh, so, first, the tangent space. So, I think in 2D case, like in surface case, the sub manifold would just become. Uh, uh, the tangent space would just become tangent plane. And I guess we all uh, know intuitively that, that what a tangent plane is. So if we draw, draw a surface like this, then the tangent plane is just a plane that just touches the, this surface M at our select point P. So that is the tangent. Plan, and if we extend this to higher dimensional, then it will become tangent space. And there are actually uh, multiple ways to, to formally define a tangent space. But, uh, but in this uh, MIT course, they choose a definition uh, using curves. So the tangent space TPM, where T stands for tangent space, P is the point we select, and M is the submanifold M. So the tangent space TPM of an M dimensional submanifold is the set of velocity vectors uh, gamma prime zero, where gamma is a curve on the 
some manifold M and it passed and the gamma zero equals P. Okay, so what this definition means. So actually, as if we consider this points here, then on, on this surface M, there can be multiple uh, curves that pass through. Uh, sorry, maybe we can actually draw another function, another surface, which kind of look like this. So at this specific point P, uh, there are multiple, there are like infinite number of curves that pass through this point P and is on this surface M. And all those curves will have a tangent vector at this point P. And all those, the set of all of those tangent vector will form our tangent space. So that's the, basically what this definition means. And then there's a very easy, a very simple proposition that is for an M dimensional submanifold, it is tangent space is M dimensional linear subspace uh, for all P on the M except, uh, except for the points on the boundary. So actually we can, uh, let me just prove it very quickly. So, Maybe I can stop sharing for now and you can, maybe you can get a larger view of my notes. Okay, so. Yeah, so we want to prove that uh, TPM is a uh, M dimensional Linear subspace. And to prove that, I we're gonna use. Uh, I don't see any. I just see your video video feed, nothing else. Yeah, so actually, it's in my another camera. So if you try to uh, uh, see the view. Oh, this. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, you say so. You, you can you can try to pin it so it will become oh, larger. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, if you all can see it, then I can see it. Then I'm gonna continue. So, uh, we are gonna use a lemma. That is so. For all the curve gamma. So gamma is a curve uh, that in the definition, so gamma is like gamma T is gamma zero plus T. There exists another curve It is actually um, dimensional space such that so yeah, can you explain gamma t again? Yeah, so just let me finish writing this. Okay. Okay, again, so here, the gamma T is like in our definition, we are consider the gamma T is the curve uh, on the surface M. So on the manifold, sub, sub manifold M, M is our sub manifolds, and P is the point we select. And the gamma is just, so if this, the gamma, this is, the, this is our surface M and this is our P, then the gamma is just, a curve on this on this surface M, and it run past the point P, and it, it, so it is by for any so it can be multiple such curve right. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay, so that's gamma, and uh, I just so 
the basic idea behind this lemma is saying that all this gamma can be seen as a composition of first, it maps the T to the, uh, because, so the G here is the, if it comes, is the local parameterized function around the piece, around the piece neighborhood. So, so remember that in the definition of the sub manifolds, we know but that- Just a reminder, if you can move your paper uh, towards the, yeah, so I think there are a pile of papers there, if you can yeah. move that out, so they can leave you much more space. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, the uh, first thing I'll keep this this way. This reminds me of old days when you didn't have iPad. When yeah. I was taking classes in my graduate school, my instructor used to write things on the paper like this and then show the video camera on top of this, exactly like this. <laughs> yeah, I do that because I don't have an iPad. Same thing. Okay, so uh, let's just continue. So uh, yeah, we're, we're talking about R here. Uh, so we know, already know what gamma is. And then for R, R is just, so what this lemma wanna do is like, uh, so gamma is like directly map the uh, real value to M. But then we're, we're just saying that then the, we can first map the T to the M dimensional uh, ORM, dimensional, which is the M dimensional space. And then use the local parameterized function to map things back to, to M. So we will take an intermediate step, right? So remember that in the definition of the uh, submanifolds for any point P, and we consider its na local neighborhood, then there is this, this, this exists a uh, local parameterized function such that it maps uh, Rm to M. So that's in the definition of the submanifolds. And actually, if we want to really prove that lemma, then we can just let R T becomes G, G active uh, gamma T. Yeah. So that's with this lemma. Uh, that's basically what is this. Then you take this to back, you would just get gamma back. So that's for this lemma. And when once we have this lemma. Yeah, what we can do is we, we compute the, because in the definition, we, can, we know that the, uh, we want to know the derivative of this gamma t, gamma zero actually, right? Which okay, we can, using this formula, we know that it's actually g t. Uh, it's actually using chain rule, I think. T times R prime T. And because RT, uh, sorry, it's R0, actually. Zero, zero, zero. Because R0 is always like, uh, R zero is always like G's inverse P. Therefore, it always equals to G prime G inverse P times R prime zero. So this one is actually, oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, I hope I hope we're going to see things now. Yeah, so this whole thing because G uh, inverse P is just a constant vector, and so is the G prime. G prime is just the Jacobian matrix. So this whole thing is a constant uh, n by m matrix, and then R prime zero is actually can be arbitrary. M dimensional vector, right? Because R 
there is an arbitrary curve in the n-dimensional space. Therefore, uh, this vector can be it, it, this vector can be arbitrary n-dimensional space. So therefore, we all we do is so we can see that gamma prime zero is just uh, n times a matrix times with a vector, and this vector belongs to an n-dimensional uh, linear space. So that's why this whole tangent space is a n-dimensional uh, linear subspace. Okay, so I'm not sure I make things clear. Do we have any questions? Okay, if not, then I think we can move on because I think for, although this proof may be a little, well, not really straightforward, but I think the conclusion is quite straightforward because like the and tangent space are and dimensional is an dimensional subspace, right? So that's for the tangent space. And then let's just continue. So once we have the what tangent space- What is the D there? Uh, pardon? Or in the proof, what is the D? What is D and what is G? G is the local parameterization function. And what yeah. is D? D. Right. Do we have D here? Capital D. The tangent space is the image DG. What is D? Oh, oh I think here. So the DG is actually the Jacobian matrix. It uses this notation. Jacobian matrix. Yeah. It's, it's because G is like the, it's a mapping from RM to RN. And then it's Jacobian matrix is like, it's the N by M matrix that uh, defines all, describes all the partial derivative. Like this, uh, I think I show it here, this. This is, the, uh, sorry, here, the Jacobian matrix. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so this simple one line is just saying that the tangent space is just the image of the Jacobian matrix. And once we have the tangent space, then we can also define the normal space, which is uh, with the normal space NTM. So M is the normal, N stands for normal, P is the point we select, M is the manifold we consider, then the, the normal space is just all the uh, vectors that are orthogonal to our tangent space. So I think by definition, it's pretty straightforward that the dimension of the normal space is n minus m. And I think in, uh, so in the special case, like the curve in a plan with the surface in a 3D space, n minus m is always one. In this case, uh, every point p on the surface admits only one normal back direction and uh, R2 scaling. So like in this example, every, this is a 2D surface on a 3D space. Then each, uh, because n minus m is one. Sorry, I forgot to, I think I forgot to share my screen. You can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see your screen. And it's, yeah. uh, it was there. Yeah, okay. All right, so I just talked about in this example, the 2D surface will have like, only have one, the N minus M is one. So you can only choose this normal direction after scaling. But actually, if you want to choose one unit, normal vector, then it ha we have to like, so there are two options, right? One, the arrow going up or the arrow going down. So actually, if we try to define a mapping from every point to its uh, unit uh, normal vector, and it is, we want this mapping to be continuous. So normally we, we will think that you know, for, for any ordinary, surface, we can do that. And actually, if we can do that, then we will call this, uh, we will call this surface to be orientable. So uh, 
Right, so that's the, the so here is the so, uh, strict definition for orient, orientable. So basically saying that if uh, there exists a continuous function that maps every point except for the boundary to its unit uh, normal vector. And as long as this continuous, this function is continuous, then it, can, it will be orientable. So like if you consider a sphere, then all the no unit vector is going uh, outwards, then this is a uh, very really, you know, simple example of how the continuous function might be. But actually there are, it's possible that the surface or the manifolds to be not, not orientable. Now, one famous example is the uh, one famous example is the mobile strip. So, uh, so to show you why the mobile strip is not orientable, you can see this example here. Okay, so this shows us sphere of the mobile strip, right? And I think we all know that what mobile strip is, right? It's just you got a strip and you just flip it and you glue the whole head and tail together, you will get a mobile strip. And so this green arrow here shows the normal vector uh, at this point. And if we just move it a little bit, we can see that and we want to make the, uh, move these things a little bit. Uh, we can see that in order to make this uh, mapping continuous, then we basically have only, have to, we will only have one choice. Uh, so originally uh, for every point, we can choose two, there are two unit vectors, unit normal vectors, right? But in order to make things continuous, then basically our choice is only, we can only choose one, this one. But if we move things, continue to move these things, and when it do things are wrong, you can see that we go back to the, uh, the point we begin, but this normal vector, it, face, it goes down, instead of goes up. So in this case, we cannot bring a continuous mapping between the point and the normal unit vector. So that's well as our definition. So the model, model strip is not orient, orientable. Okay, so do we have any question about the, this whole mobile, mobile, why the mobile strip is not orientable? Well, if not, then I th think we're back to the Okay, well, back to this definition of orientation. So that would be all I had to talk about for the properties of some manifolds. And now we just stop being too mathematical and let's consider things in a, as a computer scientist. So because uh, if we want to really represent, we want to store a surface in computer, we cannot store its continuous function. Right, we had to discretize it somehow. So in particular, we'll consider one really popular method, which is the triangle mesh. So here's an example of how to use triangle mesh to uh, discretize this surface. Okay, so there's a cute bunny, and you can see that we represent it, represent it using uh, a triangle mesh, which is basically a bunch of like, triangles that clip it together seamlessly. So that's uh, a really famous, actually a really famous example for triangle mesh. And formally a triangle mesh can be defined in this way. So it, it has vertices, edges and faces. So the vertex, vertex is just a bunch of points in the three dimensional space and the edge is the link between them. And the faces is the triangle formulated with a three adjacent vertex or three adjacent edges. So if you look at this definition, well, and at least for me, it just looks very similar to the definition for graphs. 
the right for, for graph, we, we only use it really just the V and E. Actually, triangle mesh is just a special kind of graphs. So that's just, so because of that, I just believe that uh, many algorithms like G graph neural networks can be applied to the, the problems on triangle mesh. Like for example, in com computer graphics, they usually need to sim simulate a mapping from the surface to a scalar. Like if we like if the scalar re represent the color or like the lightness of the, the point on, on surface, uh, then in the computer science we need to desecratize it so it will be as the surface for real first it be desecratized into a triangle mesh and then because triangle mesh is very similar to the uh, to the graph here so probably you can just use graph neural networks to simulate these things. Right, so I believe people have already been doing this. So yeah, so that's just a motivation why we want to know about triangle mesh because well, we can maybe we can use graph neural network to help to do you know, cool stuff they do. So back to the definition of the triangle mesh. So uh, actually this simple definition is not enough to define a valid triangle mesh that describes a surface because, of the, because there might be some things called non-manifold edge. And here's an example. So this edge here is a non-manifold edge because it has three uh, surface adjacent to it. And you can see that this thing will, it does, is definitely not the surface we want. Therefore, to exclude these non-manifold edges, uh, there are two additional constraints that are added to the um, triangle mesh, which is first, the, each edge is incident to one or two faces, and the um, faces incident to a vertex either form a closed one or open flat. So here is a closed flat. Now here's an example of the open flat. And so that's basically the definition for manifold triangle mesh. And the, it has the a valid closed triangle mesh actually has a very interesting property that is the average degree of each node will be approximately six. And so for the rest of the course, I will just try to prove that. Uh, and actually this proof is not very really difficult. We, can, we will use the older characteristic for meshes to prove that. So this, uh, this, uh, equation is a really important equation from Euler. Uh, we don't have to prove that, but we're just gonna, it is quite famous, so we're just gonna take it it's true. So what this expression says is that the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces so it equals to a constant number chi. And there chi is two minus two g, where g is basically the number of holes in our surfaces. So like in this case, in this one, if it's just a ball, then the number of holes is zero. And in this donut, then it has one hole, so the G is one. And in this, well, two nuts, two donuts glued together, you'll have two, hole, two holes, so the G is two. So with this uh, equations, and also the fact that but because we are considered a closed, a closed uh, uh, triangle mesh, which means there are no boundaries. Therefore, each edge is agent adjacent to two faces, and each face has three edges. Therefore, we can get a really simple equation, uh, the relationship between two E and F, that is two times E equals to three times F. Uh, by plugging this, this thing into or this equation, we will get V minus half, uh, 0 0.5 times F will be our chi. And actually, because we can imagine that the, so the chi is like two minus two G, where G is the number of holes. So as long as the surface is not too crazy, like well, you know, as long as we are not simulate a surface like a sponge, then we can think then the chi should be a very small number. On the other hand, number of V and F should be really large, like millions of 
thousands of them. So therefore, we can basically say that we minus 0 0.5 times f will be equal to zero, which means f is approximately equals to two v. And then by plugging this results back to all these things, we'll get uh, e, well, the number of edges will basically be three times the number of vertices and the number of faces will be two times the number of vertices. And because the average degree is basically two times e divided by v, therefore the number of the average degree of each node will be approximately, approximately six. Okay, so do we have any question about how we got prove this conclusion? Why chi equals to zero? Yeah, so chi is not strictly equal to zero. It's just because compared to V and F, chi will usually be a very small number. So it's just- Does the triangle mesh usually does not have holes? Yeah, so because, well, if it's even zero or one or two, then all the things will be like, what we can basically say is a very small number, like smaller than 10. But for, if like, you know, this funny example, you can see the number of vertices and number of edges is a lot larger. That's why mm -hmm. we can basically say that chi is zero. I see. Okay, so. That's basically all I, all I have for today. So that's, I'm just gonna wrap up the whole thing. So today I'm, I have introduced the definition for the surfaces and submanifolds. And just recall the submanifolds is just a generalization for surface. So surface uh, is a special case of So, consider the desecrated representation of surfaces. And well, if you maybe someone will get, will get interested and find to try to use GN to help mm, the problems on the triangle meshes. Yeah, I, that's all I got for today. Do we have any questions? So following your uh, comments, like uh, the triangle mesh, actually it's a graph. I think uh, last quarter, Shi Tao um, introduced one paper uh, which aims at build 3D triangle mesh from a 2D image in a unsupervised fashion. So I think that uh, that paper is quite interesting. Probably Shi Tao later, you can forward the paper to, to the group. Yeah, yeah, of course I can do that. Okay, thank you. Oh, if there's no question, I think I'm just in it today. So that's actually quite faster than I thought, but well, I guess no one will be complaining that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.